open up your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians, and we will be touching all the way through chapter 3, verse 4, starting on chapter 2, verse 6. I'm going to invite you to read that with me to understand what we will be teaching through today. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6, all the way to chapter 3, verse 4. Four, and we'll start off in verse 6. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and a hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of, or for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he, does not, he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But, he have, but we have the mind of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 1. But I, brothers could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and, and behaving only in a human way? For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not merely being human? That is the section that we will be discussing today and possibly next week as we go through 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and one of Paul's final concluding arguments in the introduction of his overall concern about the unity of the church. This is the beginning section from chapters 1 all the way to verse 4 in chapter 3. Paul's concluding remarks about the unity of the church. As we've seen and as we read, there is a mystery revealed and it is only a mystery revealed to those who are spiritual. So Paul's main goal this morning as we read through this for us is to distinguish between a spiritual person and one who is of the flesh, Paul calls, or carnal. We read it and we can see constantly that, that word being repeated, spiritual, spirit, discerning by the spirit, spiritual truths, spiritual wisdom. All of this is designed for the spiritual person. And he does so by pointing to what the spiritual person has received through the working of the Holy Spirit which ultimately changes the direction of his life. You see, the working of the Holy Spirit for Paul, as we read here, has nothing to do with these extra miraculous events that the Corinthian church was used to. As we remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, they were blessed with all the spiritual gifts. They were given all the gifts. But he's not addressing that here. He's addressing the mystery that is only revealed by the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, therefore, guides those in the church 
to therefore live according to the Spirit, which is ultimately the definition of a spiritual person. The result of the spiritual person is that they understand the revelation of God's mystery, and therefore, as we read in verse 16, they attain the mind of Christ. You got to think about that for a little bit. As Christians, what does it mean to attain the mind of Christ? What does it mean to think like Christ? What does it mean to have Christ's mind? That's a, that's a big reality for us. And for Paul, that becomes the pressing concern for a spiritual person. So as we, the spiritual person reveals, as the mystery be revealed by the Spirit of God, their actions, therefore, having the mind of Christ, follow accordingly. Since they have the mind of Christ, as we read, therefore they act like they have the mind of Christ. How does one get this mind? They get it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore we live in a manner worthy of the calling because we possess the mind of Christ. All those names Paul gave at the chapter 1, saints, brothers, church, all of these are to define or define what it means to live a spiritual life. The mystery, therefore, that Paul is consistently reminding us of in chapter 2 and at the beginning of verse 3 is this mystery, therefore, not to simply attain secret knowledge. It isn't just for information purposes to gather what even at the end of the first century and the beginning of the second century, this Gnostic movement started flourishing because of people wanting to know secret mysteries. And they were uh, infatuated with this secret knowledge that came about through, through some phony revelations. And everyone thought that they were great. And that's where we get all these Gnostic gospels from, books that are not part of our New Testament. Because people thought that receiving secret mystery was more important than what was already revealed in the New Testament canon. Therefore, it's not about secret revelation. Rather, it's about acting like Christ as opposed to a child. As opposed to one who has not fully developed in their spiritual journey. Go back to verse 6. I want to just show this quickly to you. You came, am yet among the mature, there is that word mature. We're going to study it a little bit. Really, the, the, the actual meaning of the word mature is adult, being an adult. Look at what he says in chapter 3. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, what does he call them? Infants. So here we have the, the separation. Mature people, infants. Spiritual people are mature. People of the flesh or carnal are infants. There's nothing wrong with being a child, correct? Every single person here was an infant. Maybe 40 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, maybe some of you 20 years ago. We were all at one point in our lives infants, but it's not okay to stay that way. Unfortunately, many 25-year-olds still have a mind of an infant, but that's another story. What I'm trying to say is it's not okay for Paul, as he presses on with this spiritual discernment and the mystery, as he presses forward in this, he, he is making the emphasis that it is not okay to be a child in the things of God. Especially after quite a period, period of time has elapsed. Yes, there is a process in the Christian life. However, that process should be working. This is for Paul important because those who receive the mystery receive it from the Spirit which causes them, therefore, to have the mind of Christ, which ultimately looks like you are growing in the things of Christ. You are becoming mature. 
That is what Paul is beginning to stress. The the verses are, are, are segmented in such a way to teach us exactly how Paul is thinking through this. In the first three verses, uh, 6 through 9, or the, at the end of six, six, uh, verse 6 all the way to verse 9, is this or, the origin of wisdom preached. It comes from the Spirit of God. In verses 10 through 13, the Holy Spirit has revealed this wisdom. So it isn't as if human beings found the wisdom by themselves, it was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. Then he emphasizes in verses 6a and verses 14 through 16, those who have received this revelation, which for him will be the spiritual people. And then finally, in the last segment of verse 16, the outcome of those who receive this mystery means that they have received the mind of Christ, or they act in a way that has the mind of Christ. What I want to do this morning is go straight to Paul's contrast. He contrasts immediately at the beginning of verse 2, I mean of verse 6, and at the beginning of verse 1, this concept of a spiritual person, and one who is natural, or of the flesh, or carnal. His main thought in this section to the Corinthian church is to make a distinction in what it means to be spiritual or natural. And for Paul, the spiritual person, we're going to address that today. And next week, we'll probably address the remainder of it or go straight into what Paul considers a non-spiritual person or basically, again, a child in the things of God. Let's go immediately to his first concern, and we're going to spend most of our time in addressing this first issue or this first distinction. What is a spiritual person? What is what Paul calls a pneumaticos, a person of the spirit? How does Paul define this person? Again, this isn't something mystical. This isn't something like, ooh, a spiritual person means that they float. It isn't that, as we'll see in Paul's argument. Spiritual person, the first thing Paul distinguishes from a spiritual person is found in verse, at the beginning of verse 6, we say verse 6a, which is the first section of verse 6. He says, yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. So this is Paul categorizing several people within the Corinthian church as being mature. He's addressing the mature people in the Corinthian church. There's obviously a distinction in the Corinthian church of those who are mature and then again, those who are like children. But the mature person, the teleos, this word is defined to mean perfect, complete, and in a literal sense, it, it means an adult. It means to be an adult. I, I like to use that emphasis on the meaning of the word because adulthood is the direct contrast to an infant. Again, I want you to have this in mind because this is what Paul has in mind as he's addressing the church. The contrast that he uses between adulthood and infancy is prevalent as he describes what it means to receive the mystery of God and putting it into action. This is what he distinguishes from everyone else as far as their infancy goes. The mature person. In verse 6b, the second part of it is that the people that receive this message... Verse, the second part of verse 6 is, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. The people that receive this message who are mature have distinguished on their own from the teaching of Paul that it isn't the wisdom of this world or of this age. Part of the maturity process is knowing what is right and knowing what is wrong. Uh, children cannot vote, right? P young kids cannot do a lot of the things that adults could do. 
And it seems like the age 21 arbitrarily has been chosen to be the defining moment of adulthood. Once you're 21, you have become an adult. Unfortunately, many birthday parties for young men at 21 show the complete opposite of being mature. It doesn't mean you are mature. It just means you're getting old. And your 20s are going to go by like this. Ask anybody that's 40 years old. 20s go by quick. But what Paul is defining here is that these mature adult Christians understand how to distinguish between the things of God the mysteries of God, our understanding the concepts of the cross and putting them to work as opposed to the wisdom of the world. They're not swayed by the wisdom of the world. We see that more developed in verse 10 and verse 12. If you look quickly in chapter 2, verse 10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. And then go to verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. So the mature person, therefore, is the one who understands the revealed wisdom that is imparted to them by the Spirit, that they may know Friends, that's the big concept in the maturity of the Christian. For Paul, the Corinthian church, those who are mature know they have knowledge of the things of God. They've shown a process of development in their thinking, completely knowing what it means to understand or grasp the mysteries of God. That's why in verse 10, the depths of God. They know the depths of God, which refers to God's divine plan for human redemption. This isn't, again, these people looking for, ooh, let me go for something deeper. Let me get something deeper out of this text or out of the meaning of of the mystery. Let me me be a, a Christian Gnostic for the first century. That's not what Paul is emphasizing here. He's teaching them the depths of God, which is, again, found in God's divine plan for human redemption. The more you know God, the more the cross is highlighted in your life because that keeps you humble. We see oftentimes how youth, how young age can keep a person prideful when they're in the presence of even older men and women. Oh, I'm young. I, you, guys, you guys live in the past. You guys have nothing to teach our generation. We, we're young. We have the energy. We have the internet. We have modernized everything from the time where you were born to now. Things have changed. You're old school. Often the old school understand the realities of life. They've processed. They've matured through the ages. How many times have you told your child Man, I've been there. How many times have you spoken to your teenager? I I was there. And I'm trying to teach you so that you don't do the same mistakes I did. How many times have we repeated that over and over again? Because there's a chasm between infancy, immaturity, pridefulness, because they know everything, and one who is mature. God's Spirit, therefore, brings us to the forefront and the adult person understands God's purposes which link God's plan and humanity together. This is why it's important for Paul to stress within the Corinthian church, those who are mature have connected in such a way, have developed in such a way. The mature, the adult in the Christian world, for Paul, therefore, is one who can receive the things of God. But even when they act, how they live, they're able to distinguish what is right, what is wrong, and most importantly, what is harmful. When when you're a child, you, you, you can wake up and eat, you know, 
candy all day. You can wake up and eat ice cream all day and think it's okay because it's good for you. If you let a child play PlayStation all day, that child will play PlayStation all day. If you give him his Switch all day, he will play his Switch all day. If you give a child uh, anything fun, you know, like to, to watch movies all day, watch TV or YouTube all day, that child will do it because they don't have borders. I think all of us parents understand this. That's why God gave our children parents that are wise, right? We're all wise parents. Those parents in here say amen. Yes, we are wise. God gave our children wise parents to say, hey, five hours of watching television isn't that good for you. Stop it. Hey, you have to take a shower. You haven't showered in six days. It's not right. You smell. Take a shower. Because they don't think. I'm saying this because you got to see what Paul is pressing here. As he immediately jumps into defining a, a spiritual person by beginning at this concept of adulthood. They think. They know. They distinguish. They've grown. They've developed. They understand the Christian walk in unison with the cross of Christ, which is the mystery, which is the depths that are revealed. It isn't secret knowledge again. It is the divine plan of redemption. This is the goal of the Christian life. Maturity. And Paul stresses this elsewhere. I want you to look at, at an important passage where Paul stresses this fairly uh, Importantly, go, go to Philippians chapter 3. I want you to see this. This is Paul's emphasis in Philippians chapter 3. And we'll start off in verse 12. Philippians 3 verse 12. Look at Paul understanding the, the goal of the Christian life in terms of adulthood or maturity. He says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. He's talking about living in righteousness before God. How do you obtain this completely? Well, he doesn't have it yet, Paul says, but he's getting there, which is the process of maturation, of adulthood, of growing up, of learning. And he says, those of us who are mature in thought understand this perfectly. We think like this. And he stresses this elsewhere too. Go to Colossians. Go to the next book over. Look at what Colossians chapter 4 says. Start off in verse 11 with me. And Jesus who is called... And Jesus, who is called justice, these are only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. This is Again, Paul stressing that even leadership, people in prayer are praying for the church for their maturity, for them to grow. I want to keep stressing this a little bit more. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. This is important for you to know too. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. We'll start off in verse 12. We'll start off in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, 
the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood or adulthood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There, there is Paul's heavy emphasis on maturity and the standard, my friends, isn't some regular person. The standard of maturity is Christ. And, and the process, therefore, of maturity must get you and me to Christ. That is what we are to look like. That is what we are to act like. That is what we are to think like. And the whole church, even the leadership of the church, including the apostles, the prophets, the, the, the teachers, the pastors, the shepherds, they are guiding the, the first century church and even continue with the evangelists and the pastors that are here today, continuing to build up the church to get there. The reason why you come to church, friends, part of that reason, other than glorifying and magnifying God, is that you have people here like Pastors, shepherds, and teachers that are giving you and equipping you with the word of God in order for you to live your life according to what you know from God's word. Is that clear? That, that becomes the main emphasis. Why, why do we have to sit down for about 45 minutes, and sometimes Jonathan takes about an hour of preaching? Well, why do we have to sit on Sunday mornings and go through this somewhat of a routine where we pray, sing, listen, read, and then have to sit for about 45 minutes and hear someone talk? What does that imply? Well, we see that in the first century church that the apostles did that with the beginning church in Acts. That's what they said under the teaching of the apostles because the church in its infancy began to grow and develop. And the more it grows, the more teaching you have to do. I'm not just trying to defend my job position here, friends. I'm not just trying to defend my, my, the, the rest of the pastor's position here in the church. What I'm trying to say is that the reason we're here is to equip you for the maturing, for the looking in the manhood of Christ, for getting, the equipping, the, the, the fortifying of the church into the manhood of Christ. That is our goal, friends. That is why we do this. And Paul, therefore, has all of this in mind as he approaches the Corinthian church. A mature Christian a pneumaticos, a spiritual person, means they are mature and that their life is guided by maturing in the fullness of the stature of Christ. That's why he ends that section with, we have the mind of Christ in verse 16. This is what the emphasis is. A mature person, therefore, will also imply they're falling in line with Christ's teaching of maturity. I don't want you to have to go there, but you, you must remember that one time in Jesus' most famous preaching and sermon, that he calls the people, especially his disciples, to be perfect. Tell us again, the same word as your heavenly Father is perfect. This isn't only the goal in life to attain the likeness and the fullness of Christ. It is to be obedient to Christ himself. Because if we follow Christ, we follow his example as well. If Paul has placed the standard is Christ, Christ was obedient to the Father even unto death. And now, as Christ calls his disciples to be perfect, to be mature, to be adults, that is our mission in life. We cannot be comfortable in one level in our lives and simply say, 
that's just the way I am. Take it or leave it. This is me. You like me or you hate me. Take me. And, and we, as Christians, it's sad to say that's how many of us act. Well, it's just how I am. I don't care. I don't care if you like me or not. It's just how I am. There's a lack of maturity. We're acting like children. Paul says that the mature in the Corinthian church have understood what it means to live subservient to the cross. The example of humbleness, of servanthood, of sacrifice is found in the cross. And we get it because we're mature. That's what the mystery, that's what the depths of God reveals, right? And that's why Paul says, we come to you with speaking the mystery of God to the mature. There are mature people in the Corinthian church. Unfortunately, there are many who are not. What's another example of a spiritual person? The first one was, for Paul, a mature person. The second one is found in verse 7. A spiritual person is therefore a receptor of the secret hidden wisdom, the mystery of God. Look at verse 7. Go back to 1 Corinthians. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. This is the wisdom we speak, Paul is saying. This is the mystery we give, opposed to the mystery of this world or the wisdom of this world. Again, what is the mystery? It is God's plan of Christ crucified. It's about salvation for our glory. Look at that again. Which God decreed before the ages for our glory. What does that mean? Future glorification. A moment when we will no longer have to be surrounded in sin in our minds, bodies, souls. Every part of us will be free from our sin. Paul is reminding the Corinthian church, therefore, there is a moment of glorification. There is a moment where you will achieve full adulthood, full maturity, and that is glorification. And this is God's plan, and that's part of the mystery. It's the divine plan for human redemption, which is the emphasis. God's divine act of love as effected on the cross, demonstrated on the cross, shown on the cross, which also gives the believer sonship, adoption, reconciliation, relationship with God the Father. That's the mystery that Paul is Reminding the church that a mature, a spiritual person can receive and has been given to them. It was not only given, but Paul clarifies this even more to magnify the importance of the mystery. In, in, in verse 7, it was predestined. Interestingly enough, the ESV doesn't translate the Greek word proorizo, which means predestined. If you have the LSB, it'll say predestined for us. It says here also in verse 7, decreed before the ages for our glory. What, what, it, what this means is that this plan was God's original design for salvation and for redemption. It wasn't as if God thought of it on the whim. Oh man, they messed up. What should we do? It was predestined, decreed for our glorification. And that's the mystery that is given to the mature, to the spiritual. And that is why it's hidden. It is put aside, which the Greek word means more clearly. It is set aside from many. Hidden. From many, go back to verse 7. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Set aside, separated, hidden from who? 
Well, what has Paul been stressing this entire time? It's been hidden from the wise and from the powerful of this age who aren't even looking for it because they found their own wisdom. They found their own truth. They found their own power. Jesus reminds us of this. If you remind, if you go back a couple of months when we were still in John, maybe a year ago, John 14, verse 17, Jesus says, Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and you and will be in you. This spirit of truth indwells the believer, indwells the, the, the spiritual person, and to everyone else, the wisdom is therefore concealed, hidden, set aside. As we consider this decree and predestined mystery, which is hidden from all, it ultimately goes into what Paul considers by quoting from the prophet Isaiah in verse 9, at the end of verse 9, he says it was prepared by God. Go back to chapter 2, verse 9, and verse at the beginning, sorry, at the beginning of verse A uh, of verse 9, it says, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined. But what? It was prepared by for those who love him. God prepared this mystery for his people. It was prepared by God. No one could have thought of it. That's why no, eye, no, no ear has heard, no eye has seen. No one would have been able to design such a foolish mystery, which means a man hanging on a cross that would never have come across anybody's mind, especially in the Corinthian context. This alone, this mystery alone was prepared for God's people by God. That's the second definition of a spiritual person. They are receptors of the Spirit. The third definition of a spiritual person we got the first one, they're mature. We got the second one, they're receptors of, this, of the Spirit, uh, of the Spirit's wisdom. And the third one is a spiritual person is defined by their love for God. Go back to verse 9. What do we see in verse 9 after it's been, no eye has seen, no ear heard, no heart imagined what God has prepared for those who what? Who love Him. A spiritual person, therefore, is categorized by this affection of the heart. They love God. A spiritual person for Paul is someone who has rejected the wisdom of this age in their constant pursuit of their passion for God. Nothing else gets in the way of their love for God. Nothing else comes close. Nothing Measures to the wonderful beauty of the cross. No one can take their eyes off the glorious cross. A mature person, a spiritual person, is one who loves God and is not swayed by the things of this age. Paul's talking about the Corinthian way. They're, they're, they're gods, they're goddesses, their lifestyle, their wealth, their poetry, their women, their prostitution, their, their ways of living that really deal with a lot of what the heart, carnal heart desires. None of that comes close to the mature person's eyes set on God. You, 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 you can simply think of that moment for all the men here that have been married. You, you remember that exact moment, right? You stand at the altar and you're standing there nervous. Your palms are sweaty. Your, your whole body's sweaty. You're standing there and you're waiting that moment when everyone stands up 
the music changes and, and, and the beginning of that wonderful tune of here comes the bride. Everyone stands and they look down the aisle and they see the beautiful bride. And at that moment, you at the altar are razor focused on your future bride. Taylor Swift could walk before you. You won't look the other way. Any other woman will walk. Nothing will distract you from watching your bride come down that aisle. You begin to cry. You begin to feel joy. You're, just, you're in love. And, and, and what Paul says about a spiritual person is that they only have eyes for God. Their only affection is set on God. They love God. This isn't a small word for Paul. We're, we're so used to love. We're so used to saying love. I love. I love French fries, friends. It's so like nonsensical now. For Paul, this is a big word. He's going to spend a whole chapter on it. Chapter 13. This is not an easy word for Paul. God has prepared all of this, all of this secret wisdom, all of this mystery is wrapped up in this one area of the heart. Your love for God. You reject the world, Paul says. In verse 12, the beginning of verse 12, they did not receive the spirit of this world. And that verb in the present tense is an active rejection. It, it, it's not a passive word, verb where they were, you know, divinely made ignorant towards the things of this world. No, no, no. They, they, they actively rejected the wisdom of this world. They actively rejected the philosophy of that age. They actively rejected the gods of that age. They actively rejected the Corinthian way of that age because they loved God. They loved his son. They loved his plan for redemption. They did not accept it. They know that the spirit of that world that spirit of that age with their multiple gods really hates God, rejects God. It rejects God's message and it rejects God's messengers. They killed Christ. A mature person, the spiritual person, as a lover of God, wants to know God. And that's why in verse 15, he's categorized in the following way. At the beginning of verse 15, the spiritual person judges all things. This word for judges is the word that means evaluates, considers, puts to the test all things. Why? Because it's the wisdom of God that is given. If it's the wisdom of God that is given, it must be evaluated. If, it, if it's evaluated and judged and it's not the wisdom of God, it can be discarded as the wisdom of this age. Friends, the love of God means for Paul that they're also lovers of truth. It isn't like the, this fairy tale that we live in several churches in, in our modern day. And we saw this even in the third century church where the lovers of God simply wanted to be in the presence of God. And they wanted to be in the presence of God so much. I mean, it's not a bad thing to be in the presence of God. But they wanted to be in the presence of God so much that they fabricated emotional uh, services to, to kind of fabricate the presence of God. <gasps> Oh, I feel it. Do you feel it? Oh, yes, I feel it. Oh, I feel the... Oh, oh. And, 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 and they... This was in the third century church. They were in ecstatic uh, uh, services. They were speaking these weird stuff and prophesizing these weird things and saying these weird things. Several of these Gnostic groups that were wanting the presence of God so desperately would go to mountains and seclude themselves from the rest of the world simply to say that this is where God's presence really is and he's going to come back at that particular 
place for those particular people. In our modern day, we have this in churches too. And that's why so many churches have designed the services for the people because they want them to feel the presence of God. Oh, I feel it. Oh, did you feel it today? I felt it today. I felt that. Oh, that was, the, the Spirit of God was there today. Oh, the Spirit of God wasn't there last week, but today, oh, I felt it. It was so good. It's a fabricated presence, it's a fabricated essence because they simply want the emotion. They're not looking, they're not judging, they're not evaluating truth. That's why they fall blind to a lot of the errors of that world. John is speaking in the same time as Paul maybe 20 years later, but Paul says, beloved, I mean, John says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Then he says, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which, is, which you heard was coming and is now in the world. And that's why John the apostle tells his people, test the spirits. Not everything is of God that says it, it, it is of God. Paul will later say in Ephesians chapter 2, you once walked in the spirit of this world, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That was you, but now you're able to judge for yourself because you've received the spirit of God. The person who loves God does not actively seek to side with the spirit that is contrary to the things of God. Actively opposing the Spirit of God. No, the person that loves God has eyes only for God. Friends, as we finish this service today with this section, we're going to continue next week. But I want to press you this morning. These three areas, are, Paul has two more that we're going to talk about. But these three areas of your adulthood in Christ of your reception of the wisdom of God and of your love for God should be for you a good leveling marker of where you're at in your walk with Christ. Are you mature? Do you understand the wisdom of God? And do you love God? Or are your eyes going in multiple directions? Please stand this morning. I'm going to pray for you, and Pastor, Hen, uh, Pastor Jose Luis will close us off in this service. Father, I pray that this church become mature. May the working of your spirit in us mature us so that we can stop acting like children and we can start showing our true devotion and love for you. Pray this in Jesus' name.